Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is instructor Phil Dimitriotis. I just thought I'd put together a video really quick. Uh, I wanted to stop by and just say thank you to all of you for watching my YouTube site, Phil's Design Corner. And then I wanted to take a moment to uh, uh, answer a couple questions for some students. A lot of you out there have been wondering if there's an opportunity to take any classes with me. And actually, we've been teaching some classes online uh, through Fullerton College, which is the name of the school that I teach at here in Southern California. So what I thought I'd do is put together a really quick video and um, talk about those two classes that I'm going to be offering this semester. I'm offering more than two classes, but the other uh, three classes are more of an intermediate to advanced level design course. So for you newbies and beginners that want to learn more about drawing and draftsmanship, I would heavily recommend my Art 243 Applied Perspective course. It's, it's one of the best courses that I have that took me numerous years to put together. Uh, the reason why it's so great is I combine the Art Center method of perspective, which is what I was taught, along with 18 years of my professional drawing experience with working um, at studios and entertainment companies. And I sort of combined all those together into what would be practical and what would be useful for students to use. And then the other class that I have is a character design class that just goes over some of the really fundamental basics of getting into character design. And um, I think that that's also a really great class because it opens up that opportunity for a lot of you to understand what part of the design process is and how you go about designing. There's another class too that I do have available. It's a prop design class. Uh, and I'll go over those number with you guys in just a couple minutes. I'll do a, a screen share and record those. And then I also thought I'd go over my portfolio really quick and show you some of the work that I do for the industry. That way it gives you guys a little bit better sense of what we're doing here. So um, these core three classes are without a doubt really, really important. However, though, it is important that you already have a basic drawing fundamentals class sort of out of the way uh, and you don't come in completely dull without having any drawing experience. So uh, with, without saying anything more, let me just show you the link to the catalog and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we do in those classes uh, and give you some samples and then hopefully that'll answer any questions that many of you have had about how do I take some of the classes that you teach? Um, and they are available online. We did move to an online format and I've decided to stay that way. Even though some instructors are going back to school, this next semester for me is gonna be online. And then um, if my enrollment stays really high up online with those of you out there in the digital world um, and online, I'd like to continue that on Mondays and Wednesdays having classes online while uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays will become my in-class meetings only. So anyway, um, if you have any questions, I'll also put my email up and you can feel free to email me. In regards to the payment um, and how much it costs, I do work for, uh, it's, it's called Fullerton College and we're, um, it's a state school, it's a state community college out here in California. And um, we don't have any control over the pricing. The price is $150 a class for uh, 17 weeks long, minus the first week, you're basically about 16 weeks. Uh, for $150, it's a pretty amazing deal. And that's for California residents. For non-California residents, you're jumping up to the price range of about $950 a class, which still, I know it seems like it's pretty steep, but I used to teach at some other online schools in the Los Angeles area, and their tuitions are 900 bucks to $1,200, for only eight weeks of school. And usually the first week and, and the last week are gone because those are just primary meetings. So you only have really uh, six to seven weeks of pure instruction at $1,200. So again, to be able to get a class, even if you live in another country and you're out of state, to be able to have a class where you're uh, uh, paying 950 for 17 weeks is still a really good deal. And I still think it's a pretty affordable deal. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let me show you guys um, and share my screen top, uh, my, sc my desktop with you, excuse me, and go over some more information with you. Thank you, everybody. And I appreciate your support on Phil's Design Corner. And I will talk to you soon. All right, everybody, welcome back. So what I want to do really quick, I want to show you a couple samples of what we do in the Art 243 Applied Perspective class. So uh, once again, what happened is when I came to teach at Fullerton College uh, back in the day, and it wasn't just Fullerton College, I was teaching 
at a school in Burbank. I was teaching at Laguna College of Art and Design, and I was also involved with uh, starting to get involved with teaching at Computer Graphics Master Academy. And one of the things I noticed when going to a lot of these institutions is perspective was something that was quickly covered. Um, in a class, meaning there was somewhere around four to five weeks maximum of coverage. And then the other thing um, that I didn't like is perspective was also a topic that was oftenly read out of other notebooks or books that were created on perspective that were quite oftenly wrong or had information that was incorrect. So when I learned perspective, I learned from an instructor who had graduated from Art Center College of Design, and he taught us the Art Center method of perspective. And then that's when I was a student way back in my early 20s. And then I went out, finished college, worked in the entertainment industry for uh, numerous, numerous years. And then I decided to sort of create a new class that we would deal with application and applied techniques. And the important of that is that you, the viewer, are taught the basic techniques of drawing and design. And then at your level, you need to learn how to incorporate some of those drawings and designs back into the way that you're using perspective. And for everybody, it's going to be different. In that application method, what's really, really important is going over some of these basics, okay? And understanding um, what is the cone of vision? How does drawing work? How does draftsmanship work? Um, how do you understand one point, two point, three point perspective? What about two point vertical perspective? What about two point to three point uh, pans and shots? And so all this information is covered in the class. How do shadows work? What's the difference between natural light and artificial light? Um, how do you use uh, mathematical techniques to figure out tiled floors? in proportional division, transfers of scale. How do you draw objects and draw through the other side to find legs and body width? Uh, how does perspective work when you're drawing airplanes and vehicles? So this is a lot of the subject matter that I cover for the whole class. The only difference is, is I was able to comprise all of this information into uh, a whole entire semester work worth of class where you are taking notes from me every day. So basically I sit and I draw every single day and then I record those lectures. You go through the you go through all the entire lectures and then you reword it in in your uh, verbiage in the way that you see it in the way that it makes sense to you. And then at the end of the semester you do like Daniel Chernegg has done here, you turn in a notebook. So we do go over assignments. I give you assignments in one point, two point, and three point, and we start from a, a design fundamental where I critique those assignments and I talk about do's and don'ts and how to make your composition better and all these other elements. So it actually ends up being quite a wonderful class because not only are you learning foundational uh, aspects of draftsmanship and drawing, but you're doing it live in class while you're drawing and doing um, uh, a project assignments, excuse me. And so anyway, I go over everything from, from 1.2 point and 3 point. I talk about what to do, what not to do. And you basically make an entire notebook on this. And your notebook is going to be about 84 pages long. And it's going to encompass uh, encompass everything that you could possibly imagine from drawing angled hills and plains. How do you draw houses on hills? Um, how do you draw uh, stairs and staircases? Uh, how do you draw them turning in perspective at different angles? Um, the difference working in two-point perspective, uh, understanding how part of two-point perspective is part of five-point perspective. And, and then we just go through the design process where you're literally drawing and designing in class. Okay, we even talk about how perspective works with the human figure and the importance of understanding the principles of draftsmanship with parts of the human figure and how that relates to figure drawing, uh, drawing organics, um, and, and just all of this comes together into this wonderful world of perspective. Uh, we talk about ellipses and tires and how to draw barrels. Uh, correctly in perspective. We talk about upshots and downshots and how perspective changes. We talk about the do's and don'ts of perspective. And, you know, my end goal in this class is just to get you to level up in your draftsmanship. And and I have to be honest, and I think I'm, I'm just uh, sharing this information. The majority of colleges out there, the art instructors have 
no clue of what they're doing and they don't really know how to teach perspective. And I come from this belief system that you really don't have to go pay for an art center college education, which is, you know, I love art center. It's a great school, but you're talking about $175,000 for three years when you can just get a really good instructor that knows what they're doing, that has professional experience, that are going to show you the tricks and the little do's and don'ts of how to draw correctly. So that's why I really love this class so much. And my students that have taken this class, many of them have gone on to work in the industry. So I know what we're doing is right. And I know we're going in that right direction. So anyway, I just thought I'd go through some of the, these notebooks to show you what you're going to be doing in this class. It is a lot of work, but you know what? You leave the class understanding uh, you know, everything about drawing and draftsmanship and light and shadow and times of day, uh, where light affects on the equator and other parts of the world. Um, all of this good stuff is going to come out into this class. OK, so there's my first notebook uh, that came from one of my students, Daniel Chernig, who absolutely uh, did a wonderful job inside the class. Um, we even talk about some things specific to animation, like how to create pans, how to do pans for storyboards and, and live action film and animation. And a lot of this stuff is really, really important because it's, it's industry information that I only learned from working in the industry that I'm sharing with you. OK, so that's one of the first notebook samples I thought I'd share with you. Um, I shot I'd, I wanted to share this. This is another one from one of my students, Camille. Eckrich, uh, she did a wonderful notebook and I love the pink. It's in that um, having a, a daughter myself, it's really cool to see a girl's touch to a perspective notebook. And one of the common things I get here are all the different topics that we cover over the semester. We have 84 topics right now going up to the final topic, which is a spiral staircase basics on how to draw that. And we just go through all of this information in the class. We look, we, I like to look at samples for movies and current concept art. So you get a good idea of what they're doing and how they're using perspective. And, and there's also a, an emotional content of why we use perspective. And this is one of the things that bother me when you go to a, like a college and you take a drawing class in, in, this is how you know whether or not an instructor really knows what they're talking about with perspective. Perspective is used for emotional content. And I have some lectures up on Phil's Design Corner that talk about that, about when we use inside storytelling one point, two point, and three point perspective. And that's really, really imperative um, to being a good designer and being a better artist. So one of the things I love most about this class is as I have students going through this class, they sit there sort of shell-shocked learning about what to do and what not to do. And their artwork changes and they become better draftsmen within a semester. And there's a lot to say about that because that can be really difficult and hard to do um, it, with many colleges and many classes. And I'm sure it's funny. I just talked to a student who lives all the way in South Africa. I talked to another student who lives in, in Hungary and another one in Bulgaria. Um, these are students that I've met through Phil's Design Corner. And they tell me the same thing, like, how come teachers don't teach this in college anymore? And I'll be honest to tell you this. The reason why a lot of teachers don't teach this is because of the way the college and the university system works, which is they require you to have a master's degree in a particular subject matter, but that doesn't mean you have professional experience. So because of that, you get a lot of teachers that have these master's degrees, but they suck at drawing and they have really bad professional experience. And they don't have this level of understanding with ellipses and perspective changes and, and how to draw, you know, barrels and really complicated objects. They don't know how to do this because they never worked at a professional level. And yes, am I saying that professional people are better than perhaps the fine artists? Not that we're better, but we're more trained and we're more skilled. And this is how the system of education used to be. And then it really got dismantled during the 60s and the 70s with part of the fine art movement, which has taken away the basics of draftsmanship and understanding how to draw. And most importantly, I'm, I'm going to stop right here on Camille's, but how do you draw from your imagination? So that's a key difference is a lot of instructors teach, how do you draw from observation? Okay, we get it. You're at week seven in a drawing class and you're drawing a stool. 
I'm like, really, that's all you can think of at week seven to teach students how to draw something really simple and mundane as a stool. Um, you need to go, you need to be able, to, the part that bothers me is a majority of art instructors out there have given up on the ability to push students. You can really push students if you give them the proper tools and the directions on how to make something and something that's really, really important that deals with visual communication, storytelling, concept design, art, animation, film, is that we are drawing and designing from our imaginations, I'd say about 90% of the time. So it's important for me as an instructor to be able to show that to you, the student, so you really get a good understanding on how to apply those techniques and get that out on to paper or onto a digital canvas. And that's the difference, is that I can't set up a still life of a bunch of buildings, but I can show you how to make those cubes and shapes, and then we can go back into that and add on a series of detail, and voila. I have students knocking out drawings like this one after another after taking this class, and then after having them with me for about a year, a year and a half, they start to get portfolios put together, and then they start sending their work out, and they get jobs at animation companies or film companies. Um, we even have students that work for vans, that work in consumer products, that came from a drawing background that learned Maya in 3D, and then they take that drawing and design knowledge, combine it with a 3D software. There's so many different avenues that students can start to go into, but having an understanding of the basics. And this is the basics, okay? If you have an art instructor that doesn't understand the difference between natural light and artificial light and man-made light, um, and the differences on how they work, then you should consider finding another instructor for drawing that. And I am uh, very strongly, I feel that these are topics that should be covered in basic drawing classes, but they're not. So here's another great notebook. This is from one of my students, um, Leah. Okay, this is um, really fantastic. It's very organized. She has lots of good examples and samples in here of us talking about how perspective works, the do's and the don'ts. So basically, every time we meet, I am drawing live for you in class going over this information, okay? Um, and then after you go over some of the basics and you start to figure stuff out, we start going you know, into assignments, you know, like how do you draw the interior of a warehouse? Uh, how do you understand placements? How do you understand groupings and uh, compositional awareness and uh, pathways for animation? And this is, you know, this is what we're doing. This is page 17 here, and we're going to 84 pages of total drawing and draftsmanship. So this is why I really wanted to come back and really promote this class. And the other great thing, too, is I have lots of students since we went online because of COVID. I have students from Northern California, Central California. I have students from Tennessee, uh, from the East Coast that are all coming back to tell me. I even have a, a student who's studying at, um, at a very prestigious art school in New York that came to tell me like, we don't even have anything like this that deals with perspective and draftsmanship. And there's a reason for that. Like I said before, unfortunately, um, there are people out there that believe that there is a more conceptual fine art approach that was more important for drawing and that uh, understanding draftsmanship and perspective really isn't important anymore. And one of the things that's even happened, happened to me is I've been labeled by people in my own department where I teach at as being, oh, Phil teaches drawing from the imagination. No, it's not drawing from the imagination. I'm teaching what I was taught. And I had a really great instructor named Mr. Miller back in the day at Fullerton College when I was 18. And Mr. Miller taught me how to draw from observation. He taught me how to draw from reference. And then he also taught me how to draw from imagination. So it's actually combining all three of those aspects together. Then here's my, my whole thing to that is when people say, oh, you draw from your imagination or that's how Art Center teaches people or that's what the how to draw book from Scott Robertson is. I'm like, no, that's a little bit incorrect. You are taking fundamentals of mathematics and draftsmanship and you're applying them to learning how to draw. So when you do draw something, you can figure it out. That's the difference. Okay, and you can really see that difference when you go out with somebody. And here's the biggie. 
If you've ever been in a drawing class or an art class and you go out with somebody to go out and sketch, you have to know how to break down the drawing. You have to be able to look at a building and understand where the horizon line is and where are the stairs. How do the buildings converge away from you? Uh, what's the difference between one point and two point? What's the difference between a horizon line and an eye level? Uh, what happens when you're in an airplane and you're looking down on top of a set of buildings? Where's the horizon line? Where's the, the ground plane line? What What's a vantage point? You know, what are all these different things and what do they mean? And these are the important topics that I just feel like are not really being conveyed anymore inside art schools. Okay, so anyway, um, let's wrap this one up here. I'm just sort of going through it really quick because, you know, we talk about so much important information that deals with draftsmanship. And I've really had a couple of years to really fine tune this class and bring it down into something that I consider to be one of the best uh, draftsmanship and design classes that are out there. So anyway, if, uh, I'm going to continue forward. I want to show you some other samples for another course. But this is the uh, ART 243 samples of, of a couple different notebooks from students. This is the final project that you turn into me by the end of the semester that shows us your ability to understand one point, two point, three point, two point verticals, two point to three point convergence, and then four point and even five point perspective and how they all work together in terms of design and drawing. Okay. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and jump forward here. And I want to show you a couple samples from the character design class and talk a little bit about what we do in there. Hi, everybody. So I wanted to take a moment here to show you some samples of some drawings from students for the character design class. Uh, the character design class is a class that I wrote and created, um, and it sort of serves a, a different purpose. Um, let me explain. Everyone's interested in being a character designer. However, though, one of the biggest problems I've noticed inside people that want to work in animation or the entertainment industry is they want to be a character designer because they were trained sort of with an illustration background and they want to just dive in and do pretty renderings of characters. And that's not what we do in the character design class for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's really, really difficult to go right out into the industry and get a job as a character designer because most of the character designers have already been working in the industry for a minimum of five to 10 years plus, and they tend to be the people that get the jobs first. However, though, what I like to think of the character design class is, is the ability to teach you a different approach to designing and drawing by looking at silhouette shapes, doing multiple versions, and not coming up with your first idea, but searching, coming up with like your 15th or your 20th idea, then bringing that to life. Um, the success we have had is students that are really good with character design inside their portfolio uh, have this ability to go out and work in storyboarding, uh, to work as revisionist artists on storyboards, and also having the painting background often get jobs associated with prop design, or even at some companies they still do what is called a uh, rough layout and character layout, which is where you have an environment drawn and you're drawing the character posed at different angles. So that way they send that to the overseas studio so they understand how to draw the animation and the posing of the character. So that tends to be what our class supports. And one of the things I really want to talk about with character design is the importance of teaching students the basics of uh, the approach, you know, gathering lots of reference, knowing your subject matter, doing silhouette studies like you see up here on, on the left hand side here, then exploring your character. Then you bring it to like a more finalized render and state and with presentation. And that becomes really, really important. So that's something I notice a lot of students don't do and they've never been trained to do is to understand part of that design process. So the thing is, is that everybody draws at different levels. Everybody has different influences and everybody sort of has a different place on where they want to be with character design, which is totally fine. What I tend to do is your instructor, um, since being in the industry, um, when I was a big idea, the, the VeggieTail people, I did get to do some character design on some of the new animated projects that we're working on. So what I thought I would do is sort of 
help students push them in the right direction of developing their own style, their own background, and it's something that's a little bit more competitive that can open the door for them. And where we've been really successful at that is students getting jobs as children's book illustrators, illustrating books for publishers and for uh, other uh, writers and creators where they're bringing these new style of characters. And a great example of this is Christina Cornett. So Christina Cornett was with us for a couple of years and then she took off and now she's working for uh, as a concept artist doing game design at a game studio on the East Coast of the United States. So I thought I'd bring this up. These are some samples here from the book I put together. Um, if you would like a copy of this book, you can email me and I'd be more than happy to send you a digital download to it. Um, it's a book I put together on our course and our program. And again, here's some other drawings. This is Maddie Hodges right here. You can look up Maddie. She's really, really talented. Um, she, she was able to get a job working at Disney Television after she left our program. What I really liked about Maddie is Maddie was one of those students that came right in from just a high school, studied with us for about two and a half, three years, and then we were able to get her out. So again, it's, it's looking at silhouette. Uh, it's looking at, at detail and posing and, and just really spending a lot of time doing drawings before you get to this finished stage of digital painting. So in character design, it is in your best interest to have a background in being able to not only know perspective and draw a little bit, but also knowing digital paint. So, and that's one of those touchy techniques because there's so many different software platforms out there. I have students that know Photoshop. I have students that know Crit. I have students that work only on their iPads, that um, work in a variety of different software, everything from Procreate to like Sketchbook Pro. Sketchbook Pro is free and has some really good versions in there too. And then one other thing we do focus on in the character design class is I teach you how to do a professional turnaround. And there are two different types of turns that we do that are relevant to the industry. So this tends to be, you know, a lot of the common searching for expressions and poses and ideas and ideation. And this even leads into the second character design class too. So the purpose of this is basically to get students familiar with a style that's not their own style and then they get you to draw outside of the box and think about the ability to approach from a design standpoint, which I think is really, really important. Um, different variations, different styles, and, and not just being a one trick pony where you're like, yeah, I only like to draw one type of person and I only like using the color purple. Purple. Well, that's not really going to work and it's going to affect you a little bit. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw up some samples up there really quick. This is for Dart 110 Intro to Character Design. If you're interested in that course, I do have about another 10 to 15 seats open. And it's just a good old-fashioned drawing course where we draw a lot, we're in sketchbooks, we work on projects, and I think it's really become a really great course. And when I lo look at the success of past students, the work that's going in their portfolio is getting them jobs and getting them gigs on other projects. So that's what's really, really important to me. So that's Dart 110. There is a follow-up class at Dart 110 the following semester, which is the Dart 111 course. And the assignments really do jump up to a higher level of design. Um, in fact, this student here is Sarah Walter. She was with us. She actually went to a local Cal State University, got out of that school, was a little frustrated with some of what she learned, came to us. I had her again for about two and a half years, and then I was we were able to help her get a job at Pure Imagination Studios, which is located in North Hollywood uh, in California. So she's doing really well there, too. Anyway, so if you have any questions about that, there's tons of other work. To, to show from other students, but I just thought I'd keep it short and sweet and sort of just scroll through part of that process and talk about what it is that we try to do. Okay, um, let me go ahead and then let's stop and I'm gonna show you one other class that I'm teaching for next semester. Okay, so the next class I wanted to, to mention to you guys that I will be teaching online will be the prop design class. Uh, the prop design class, um, the only real requirement for it is like a basic drawing requirement. So if you have that ability, you're good to go. Um, as far as painting goes, I do demos in the class that cover some of the basics 
on on how to approach so you don't as long as you have a basic understanding of photoshop you could be pretty good with understanding how to paint your props and prop design is really really important for a couple reasons number one it's one of those areas like if i go to a school and talk to a group of students and say what do you guys want to be everybody's like i want to be a concept artist i want to be a biz dev artist what most people don't realize is those positions require the average individual working as a concept artist or in a prop design, excuse me, in a, a visual development position, they usually have somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10, maybe 15 years professional experience. And then they hit this ability where they can draw in multiple styles, they can paint, they know how to design and go through this whole process. So prop design is basically like an entry level way into the animation industry, also in the gaming industry, because there are tons of props that have to be done. You have everything from mechs. Basically what a prop is, it's anything touched or used by a human hand. So it could be vehicles, it could be small items, they could be more complicated items like, you know, vehicles and trailers, they could be robots, mechs, stuff like that. And then we get, excuse me, even, even to more complex levels of prop design where you have like before and after use. So if you can imagine like a portable thermonuclear generator, something that doesn't exist, that's going to be used, let's say in a Cobra um, used by Cobra in a G.I. Joe series, right? How would you draw something that doesn't exist that's never been seen before? And then you also have to show it in use of steps of phase one, two, and three. And then you also are going to have to rotate that from different angles. And then you're going to have to color it too. So prop design has been another one of these areas that we've done very well with. And we've really been able to teach students sort of the right pathway for designing and coming up with ideas and working through part of their solutions and then taking things from, you know, reference and thumbnails, silhouettes and rough sketches into more of a finished area. OK, and, and there's lots of different types of props that are out there and there's lots of different styles. So, you know, part of your goal is finding something that you really like and then directing your artistic efforts into that background and really quick. Let me show you uh, an example here. I'm teaching a workshop over the summer, which I should have advertised on YouTube, but I didn't. Um, let me show you some of the work we're doing in that prop design workshop. So in prop design, one of our goals is to go over this background again of understanding. Here's the hard thing that I, I have to deal with as an instructor is a lot of students are trained to be illustrators, which means you get one idea only and you put it on paper. And that's not how we work in the animation industry at all or in entertainment. It's usually quite the opposite. Your goal is to come up with different variations and different styles. And what happens is that you end up sometimes by like your second or third page hitting an idea that's really, really cool and it looks really fantastic. Then we take that idea and we develop that according to what the script calls for and what the characters would need. So I wanted to show you these sketches because these are part of the thinking and the process that we do in prop design. And these are really, really great sketches that came from this summer workshop just right now I have one more week left of this current summer session and these students are really killing it they're doing such a great job with exploring ideas coming up with variations uh, drawing stuff from multiple angles and then sort of the next phase to that is then going into like a line cleanup phase where you have really good solid line work and it's something you know the line works really really imperative because this is going to go in an art direction pack to the overseas company that's then going to use this prop with the character and the environment in the storyboard with the way that the animatic in the storyboard has been created. So it's really important to have this high level of, of ability of being able to draw and design and thinking of little details, but at the same time, being able to come up with options and translate those options from reference, following the guidelines of the script and bringing something to the audience that's going to look cool and different. And a lot of that is your personal dedication and time that you allocate to your props. And all of this thinking up in the very beginning is what really makes you a good designer. And this is something I think that's really important because there really aren't a lot of colleges enforcing this anymore. They're not talking about design. In fact, I'll even say this, even at the school that I teach at, 
Uh, I question some of the practices sometimes in some of the basic drawing classes where they're just drawing, doing these huge renderings, you know, on 18 by 24 paper, but they're not really spending any time learning how to do multiple drawings and working on speed and understanding how to apply that information to a larger scale of drawing. And that's something that we do that really separates us out from the way that a lot of fine artists think. In fact, one of the things too that I noticed is I walk by and I see you know, people taking a small drawing they did and using one of those projectors and putting it up on a on a on a canvas and tracing it. And I see that and it sort of discourages me because that's not really enforcing your ability to draw and design and think of solutions and think of better posing and to draw it yourself. And when you draw things yourself, it brings out your own energy and and it makes your work just look fantastic. And so I think Lynette is a really great example of that. She's a new student I've had that has just been killing it in every single class where she goes out of her way. She keeps her drawings loose and rough, but they're fun. There's a great imagination to them. They work very well. And, you know, all of this sketching and all of this process that happens over weeks is what makes you better as an individual. Okay. And uh, here's some more work that was done by Natalie. Natalie, also a very excellent student, doing great stuff. Um, here's some more work from Robert. Um, Robert's already working in the industry and um, in the East Coast, and he's taking a couple classes with us to strengthen his abilities. Um, here's some other stuff here, too, for some different assignments. Okay, here's uh, Evelyn's work, Yonji Chen's really great stuff, really great designer. I love this vehicle on the right. I can't wait to see this going into a paint phase. It'll look fantastic. Um, these were some of our early designs from side views. And it was important for us to start from a side view, then be able to translate that into a three-quarter perspective view because it makes you better as a draftsman. So a lot of people work like this, showing your thumbnails from side views, and then you have to translate it. You have to have this ability to draw things at a three-quarter angle and be able to move it over correctly. That's Zhang's work, uh, another really talented student, a student of ours. It's really fantastic. And there's some more of Zhang's work. Uh, brought up to a tonal phase. And then what I thought I'd do is I want to show you some of the finished work that's coming out of students from this class. And so look at that. That's a beautiful page there done by Brandy. Um, it's a very professional page that just screams, let me into a studio and let me start working. Here is some really good work, very stylized and fun, sort of Cartoon Network style done by Craig Pryor. Uh, really excellent here, the line quality and then what he brought into color. Um, this is also some finished work here. I did a couple of demos for students on how I would paint these props. I record it and then put those up on YouTube as an unlisted private listing. And then I allow, then these students can watch the demos over again and they can sort of combine my method of digital painting also with something that, that maybe they do or maybe it's a different software that they use that they really like. And they end up with some really fantastic results. I'm really, really proud of this class. When I look at this work, it's really top-notch A-level work. And this is... I'll be honest with you, This a lot of this work coming from our students, this is better than some of the work I've seen coming out of some of the studios that I've worked at before. So there's something to say about a student's drive and ambition to design and work well and to go through all these phases, bring it to a digital paint and really allocate your time to produce solid work at this level. You know, really fantastic stuff. So um, there's a place in the transition from even a rough mock-up even to a finalized paint and looking at the reads and how, how everything comes across. This is Elan's work. Elan, thank you. Another great student that we have. So at our school, the one thing I love about our campus is that, you know, even though we've been going a little bit online with some areas, and I really like the online approach, is that we have a lot of students that are coming to us that have already have four-year degrees from like a Cal State or a university, or they went to a private art school, art school and they sort of get booted out of those schools and then they feel a little frustrated and lost like you know hey I had one class in digital paint one class in drawing and that's all I really learned at Sheridan now I want to learn more so how do I how do we expose the students to more of that and that's something that we're pretty good at by having a variety of different classes that focus in character design environment design prop design digital painting and one of the big things too is that we only hire instructors that at our uh, in our program that have professional experience and that have worked in the industry and we don't hire what I call book instructors. I hate book instructors like the worst thing in the world is you don't know your craft and you're going to tell someone to go buy a book and they're going to have to go read through that book and then give you exercises on how to paint. 
if you can't bust out Photoshop and paint live one-on-one, -on -one, then there's a problem. And it's the same thing with drawing. If you can't sit and draw live one-on-one -on -one with your students in the moment, then there's a problem too. So that's something I think is a, is a, I know we're a junior college, but we're a mighty college in that fact. And the fact that our classes are only $150 for California residents and then they're $950 for non-residents. Still at $950, I was teaching, uh, when I was in the industry, I was teaching part-time at Computer Graphics Master Academy and our classes there were anywhere from $800 to $1,200 for only eight weeks. And you lose, the first week is meet and greet, the last week is just a crit, so you're only really getting six weeks of education versus our classes here are basically 16 to 17 weeks, depending on whether or not there are holidays involved. And you, the students end up with a really just positive outcome. And that's what I love about our program, and especially getting to work with artists Mike Sheehan and another artist, Frank Guthrie, that are part of our programs. And all the other countless part-timers that are working with us that are in the industry that come out to teach classes with us as well. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I'm going to give you some information on these classes really quick. And if you're interested, you can feel free to email me. Um, uh, I check my email Monday and Tuesday mornings, and I'm usually busy. Um, and then I can follow up with you. But if you want to go ahead and enroll, go for it. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to just reach out and ask me. Okay? So one second, let me go over some of the course information with you. I wanted to show you this class really quick. This is our DART 109 environment sketching class. And um, even though I'm teaching this next semester, I would highly recommend that you do not take this class until you take the ART 243 applied perspective. The good news is, is that these are follow-up classes. So after you take ART 243 applied perspective, then you want to go into environment sketching because I've already taught you the basics of, of drawing and draftsmanship. We talk about 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 4 point, 5 point, how to use it. And then you get to apply that onto real life projects that are going to mimic sort of studio based assignments. Okay, so um, this is a majority of the work that I did in the industry. And so um, I really enjoy this class. We've had a lot of great success from it. And again, a lot of this is about good old fashioned drawing, designing, looking at reference, being able to take the work that you do from a thumbnail into a rough stage and then be able to take it from there into a tonal stage and be able to produce tonal studies uh, that display mood and time. So once again, you don't want to take this class if you haven't had Art 243 Applied Perspective. If you don't know Photoshop yet, you want to wait till you have some of those other classes under your belt or a little bit more experience before diving into a class like this, because this is gonna be up there at a little bit more advanced level of drawing and design. And you can see from the student work here that it is a really great class. We have a lot of great outcomes from it. But once again, you need to sort of take classes in order. One of the biggest problems I've had recently is students taking classes out of order. They get in, into a class and then they really, really suffer on their advancements because they don't know Photoshop that well. They don't know the layer options, how to use the tools. And most importantly, they don't understand tone. They don't know how to work in values. They don't know how to do comps. And that's something that's really hard to teach right away. So usually we recommend that students have a semester or two um, of Photoshop experience and then you can apply that into your images and you get realistic work like this. This is a really great piece here from one of our students, Trevor Wright, who's gone out to do some professional work. This is also, this was Sarah Walter that I mentioned to you earlier, the student that did the character design. She also does these beautiful environments. And again, that was a huge part to her getting that job working at Pure Imagination because she's doing multiple aspects of design. She has the ability to do props, she can do environment, she can do characters. And that's really what part of our program has been about is really setting up and preparing students to when they go out there, they really have those skills or what I call those chops to land you in that professional workforce and not be just really good at one thing only, but to be good at multiple um, uh, tasks inside uh, the job industry for entertainment and animation. Okay, so if you go onto Google and type in Fullerton College, it'll bring you to the school that I teach at. So I work there with uh, two other gentlemen 
um, Frank Guthrie, who's an awesome 3D artist and, and traditional artist, and then Mike Sheehan, who is a uh, another great designer and illustrator. He's uh, worked at Disney Imagineering, uh, Disney Consumer Products, and, um, and, and done a ton of other design work, okay? So the three of us sort of head up our program together, um, and if you download this PDF right here, this is the Fullerton College schedule, and I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down here to about page 47. And so I know it's a little confusing because I teach actually art classes and I we also run the digital art program. So we have a combination of classes. Usually the art classes are more drawing and fundamental classes and then the digital classes are classes involving software that expand outward. So if you go on to page 47 here, you'll see Dart 109, Environment Sketching. It gives you the advisory, talks about the class and the date and times for that class. This will be taking place on Zoom. Um, and so there's a little bit of information there. I highly recommend you do not take this class. Trust me, I've gone over this a hundred times with students. Do not take this class until you take Art 243. Art 243 covers basics of perspective. If you don't know those, you're going to drown in this class and you will not succeed. I see it happen every single semester. Okay, um, but there's some other classes here you might decide to take with some other instructors if they're available on Zoom. So unfortunately, Every instructor has their own personal preference if they want to teach on Zoom, hybrid, or part in or out of class. So everyone's going to be different. The next class is Dart 115 Prop Design. It's listed right here on the following page, which is page 48. Okay. And then the Art 243 class, you're going to have to scroll down a little bit more. And if you come down to... Um, by the way, here's another class I'm teaching, but this is... Basic Drawing for Entertainment Arts classes is an intermediate drawing class with a focus on organic environment design. It's definitely an intermediate to advanced class. I do not recommend taking this class from the very beginning. It's way too complicated. Okay, here's a great basic drawing course uh, that should be available on Zoom only. This is Art 137 with instructor uh, Jesse Pack. That's a fantastic course something to check out. And then right here, further down on page 54, is the Art 243 Applied Perspective class. There, you can look it up right there. It's on Zoom. That's This is probably, that's the class I showed you in the beginning, my favorite all-time class to teach. Uh, it's just really fantastic. It's nothing better than teaching students how to really understand how to draw and, and introducing them to the basics of design from a draftsmanship point of view. Okay, so that's the basics for the classes. Be right back. All right, I thought I would show a little bit of my work to explain a little bit about my background and what it is that I do and what I still do. So um, I basically went to school as an illustrator and um, studied illustration at Cal State University Fullerton. And um, it was a good program, but it, it, you know, studying illustration is like this wide area of focus and with not necessarily any particular area um, focused on. And so I wanted to really get focused on other areas. And then one day we had a guest speaker that came out from the animation industry and they were talking about how they were getting paid really good money to draw pictures all day. And that really interested me. So basically uh, what I did is I started taking a lot of drawing classes after Cal State Fullerton, and I had some really great um, teachers um, that ended up becoming really good friends and people I worked with in the industry. Uh, Robert St. Pierre, Michael Spooner, um, Sam Mitchlap, and um, a lot of really talented artists that are out there, and I learned a tremendous amount from these artists. And then I started getting jobs working inside the animation industry. And so I would work on everything from TV productions, DVD productions, feature films. I worked on children's books. I did everything from doing revision work, storyboard revisions, um, uh, digital painting, digital art, um, uh, layout, background design, character layout, prop design, you name it, I pretty much did it. So it, as long as it involves some level of drawing and draftsmanship, I was all over it. Now, I like to consider myself being more of a designer where I really like to draw and I like to try to bring up the best ideas that I can for a particular production. And that was what part of my background was and what it sort of developed over time. And then one of the best things in the world happened to me. This is actually a drawing that reminds me of that when I was working a big idea, I was starting to get trained. How do I develop 
artwork that's going to support a 3D production on a 3D show. And that really sort of changed quite a bit of my life because you have to draw things from a flat front view and then you have to be able to go in and redesign those things in 3D, which changes everything. And so, you know, a huge part of my background is just being able to draw, to do rough sketches, to be able to knock out ideas and work. And, and then most importantly is working with others to communicate and understand what their vision is. It's not always my vision, but it's what their vision is and where they see a particular show going or where they see a particular world and environment going. And that's a lot of what I became pretty good at doing was being able to talk to a art director or a supervisor and find out, you know, what exactly are you imagining for the show? These were some environments here that were done for Adam Sandler's movie, Eight Crazy Nights. Um, I was working on this in the beginning with artist Robert St. Pierre before he had to take off and go to another studio. But it was doing, you know, drawing a room from multiple angles, being able to express it in tone and light and set a mood for it. Um, this is some stuff I did for G.I. Joe for the real effects company out of Texas. And so, again, just being able to draw, work on paper, come up with good ideas and variations and just sketch. And also being able to be fast, which is really important because a lot of people skip that idea. You think you have this opportunity to sit. This was a project I did for Lego on the Bionicles. And, um, you know, it, it's not... You don't always have a ton of time to do a drawing. Sometimes you only, I have to turn in like a page of thumbnails in one day and then I have to get those roughs out very quickly. So being able to work, this was um, for Christian Broadcast Network for the Superbook animated series. So being able just to work and develop work really quickly, different styles, different points of view, different backgrounds. You know, this is what I became pretty good at doing in a fast, effective manner. And then, you know, going, you know, working up to that rough drawing. And again, one thing I always talk about, it's not just starting where you want to start, but it's working through thumbnails and reference, especially the reference. Pivotal, you know, understanding what locations look like and, and matching up the script. The script calls for very specific details. You can't just draw what you want to draw. It's funny because the other day I was looking on my YouTube site and I was getting smashed. All this criticism was coming in from these artists that have no real design experience because I was critiquing someone's symmetrical cabin design and they didn't like that. And I stepped back from it and I thought about it for a minute and I realized like, you don't even know what the assignment brief is. You don't know what we were doing. There was a particular approach to the assignment, but yet it was funny to me how people want to step up and just critique your work when the, most people have never even seen my work because I really don't advertise it on, on YouTube that much. But I just thought I'd do it for this. I thought I'd show you a bunch of the designs, freelance, and some of the stuff that I have done. And again, it just depends. It's everything. You're talking about such a, log, a large quality of drawing moving from TV to DVD to feature film. And, and then there's also different times. There's different turnarounds involved. Some clients only want stuff in a line drawing. Some clients want it in tone. Some clients want you to do it in paint. Everybody is different. And every studio is different. And I think what's really important is that you have the chops and those abilities to combine and work. Now, one advantage I have was working in Maya. And so I was trained how to work in Maya. I started making pre -vis sets, which stands for pre-visualization. So where that was really important is it gave me this opportunity to do drawings from a design standpoint, but then I could model those drawings to show the director and the storyboard artist what the worlds look like. And then once approved, I could go in with a camera and I could animate a camera around, take multiple renders from different angles, and then I could help all the storyboard artists stage and set up their locations for storyboarding. And that is huge. That right there was, was really worth its weight in gold. So being able to do that over quite a bit of time on different productions for different shows, it, it really changed a lot of what I was doing. I was no longer just drawing, but I was drawing, creating worlds, environments, thinking about staging, different angles, how to tell the stories, where the camera should start. And especially with Maya, Maya is one of those complexities where you have limitations that you can do. There is a total limitation going from 2D to 3D. In fact, most artists try to get away with murder 
in the 2D element. And then when they get to the 3D element, you discover you're like, wow, there's so many things we can't do in Maya because the camera might see it or the camera has to be at a certain angle. Uh, a really good example to that I like to give in class is I had a friend of mine storyboarding on one of the Jurassic Parks and he told me one of the golden rules about not showing, keeping the camera low at a low horizon line, trying not to show the footprint of the dinosaurs hitting the ground, because when it hits the ground, it leaves this huge impression into the ground, and that every one of those impressions costs a special effects artist more money, which means the producer has to spend more money, which means you might go out of budget. So having this background to understand a transition from 2D and drawing and layout and numerous angles into, and by the way, this is a good example of the numerous angles. This was a show I worked on for Cartoon Network. Here is the, the, the exterior backyard shot, and then the backyard's gonna get destroyed, so I had to draw all these props out, but then I had to show the backyard partially destroyed, and then I also had to show it from an up angle looking down because the director wanted it to be seen from this particular point of view inside the storyboard. So again, it's that process of collaboration and working with people and coming up with ideas and being able to help them get to their achievable outcome. It's not my outcome that's measured. It's working with my directors. Um, here, this is some work I did for Big Idea, working with Mike Naraki and Phil Vischer, uh, the owners of the company at that time, you know, getting an idea of what they want and, and putting that on paper and then seeing how it translates, you know, to a finished outcome, you know. So all of this, it's just golden stuff. I love getting to do this type of design and this type of work, it's fun. I mean, it's its worth its weight in gold. Um, in this version of Bionicles, they had this dome. It was like a competition dome. And they had to come up with ideas of what the dome looked like. And they would have all these racing tracks and jumps. Luckily, I ride dirt bikes, so I had a good idea on what jumps might look like. So I was able to incorporate some ideas into that. This was some old work I did from MGM. These were just like nice, big... Uh, beautiful sketches done. Um, I love getting to draw like this. These are big 11 by 17 drawings with Prismacolor pencil that my director at that time, Phil Mendez, just said, just go have fun and just throw it down on paper and just come up with ideas on what a shaman's cave would look like and what some of these environments would be. I also got to work with a really talented guy named Drew Gentle, who had uh, been in the industry forever and another amazing designer. Both these guys, Phil and Drew, gave me a ton of great uh, and Roy, too, uh, gave me some great feedback and really directed me into a good direction. These are some some other sketches I did, working a big idea with Michael Spooner and some other ideas. You know, some of these ideas make it, sometimes they don't, because you can work on an idea that makes it, and then other times it gets shut down. And they sometimes they change the, the story, and they can an idea altogether, and you got to go back to thumbnails and thinking, and you got to go back to setting up compositional angles, you know? So anyway, uh, just thought I'd show a bunch of this stuff just to give you. These are some more layout drawings I did for eight Adam Sandler's movie movie back in the day, Eight Crazy Nights, um, with some of those, uh, some of that background. Let me show you some of the environments that I do in Maya really quick. Actually, I came across some other freelance work that I've done, and I just thought I'd pull it up really quick since these productions are out and I can share the work. I don't even have half of this work in my portfolio. Sometimes it's just quick drawings and stylistic variations. Um, this is pretty cool. This is something I got to do back in the day, working with Tom Bancroft at Big Idea. Uh, I really liked part of this, this style right here, and Tom Owens, uh, two really talented artists that are on our production. And again, just drawing rooms in multiple uh, locations from different angles and coming up with ideas, stylization, you know, just all of these are just rough little sketches that are for story aspects or, you know, design aspects and pushing something further. Um, even doing top views, orthographic views, very important to figuring out locations and ideas, you know, front and reverse views, really important too. Um, just a bunch of other different sketches here. Some of these sketches, I know some people are like, how much time are in these? I'm like, well, the thumbnail might get passed with is a 10 to 20 minute sketch. And then doing a cleanup like this, you might be in tone somewhere in the neighborhood of like, I'd say an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two. And then if there's revisions to this based off of storyboards, you could be looking at another hour, hour and a half to do the revision, depending on the level of the revision. 
So, you know, I just thought I'd throw this up. It's just more freelance work. It just shows more sketching and some of the ideas. Because sometimes when you work on projects, you're really happy to get to work on a cool project, but you don't get to do these like really beautiful portfolio pieces. Sometimes you're just doing what I call informational drawings. You're giving them an idea of how Maya works or how you should set up a street and a pan view. Um, stuff like that, you know. And how do you bring things together from beginning to the end level? So it's really a lot of fun getting to do this stuff. But remember, it's not always like a, like this. I had to design a skate park. I'm like, okay, I used to skate when I was a kid growing up in Orange County. I know a lot about skating. What's going to be in the background? Are we talking city location? Are we talking hills, mountains? They just said, well, just put it out in the middle of nowhere with pine trees. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what are you going to see, though? When you're at a top view like this looking down, you're going to see city buildings. You're like, well, we don't know yet. We haven't developed this part. So that would be an example of why you have to go back into work and finish it. And, you know, um, top view is is so important to be able to do top views and problem solve ideas of where the camera would be and how scenes get set up. Uh, it's worth its weight in gold and something really, really done that's very, very important to transmitting a, an idea from sketch and concept or, or background design art into 3D, without a doubt. Top, top views and views like this are extremely important. You know, and uh, hold on a minute. Let me pause and I'll bring up some other goodies. All right. Last here, I wanted to show you some samples of uh, my 3D stuff that I do. So uh, let me make sure I got the recorder. Yep, it's going. So one of the things I got really good with was coming from a 2D drawing and design background. When I learned Maya, Maya was really fantastic because... I started off doing pre -vis sets and then I started tightening up my sets to where I could send them overseas and they could just use them inside the live production. And that was a huge benefit for a lot of what we did because it changed the way that we were designing and working. It changed part of our work pipeline and all different studios, whether Disney or DreamWorks, they have different pipelines that they do. And being able to do this in an early phase in the production was was is golden because we didn't have to send work to a 3D department. We didn't have to wait for stuff to come back. I was doing this in the visual development phase. So as I was drawing and designing worlds, I would start modeling them really quickly while in production. And this just saved us a tremendous amount of time because I could come up with ideas for vehicles and robots and mechs and, and environments and especially organic mod modeling, which is really a lot more complex. Um, this is something I was doing for a, um, uh, oh gosh, a strawberry shortcake series. You know, a friend of mine was working on and goes, hey, dude, would you come over, help us do some modeling with some organics? Like, and the organics they're getting from overseas were horrible because nobody came from a drawing background. So they really didn't understand anything that dealt with drawing organics and designing organics in compositional groupings. And there is a, a really specific type of format that you have to follow when you get into this level of design because it changes the outcome of the drawing and the design. So having an artist that's that's can work in both from a 2D aspect, drawing, Photoshop, thumbnails, reference, and then being able to go into 3D is, is really where I started finding a lot of work when I was in the industry. And um, I started getting jobs where I got to be a production designer. I was basically overseeing everything from a drawing level, uh, going incoming from artists and freelancers, then going out to uh, foreign studios that are going to do the work. And then I would also supervise a bunch of their work that was coming back to look at the problems in the modeling or the way they were setting up the camera or other particular issues. And so for me, this really just became one of those things I just got really fast with. And one of the things I really like about Maya is that I have all of this, all of anything I model is there. And it's I can take parts from other models and combine them with other models and bring them together. And it just becomes this really wonderful design process that allows you to grow and really develop a lot of work very quickly. You know, so I, I really had a good time doing this. I miss this type of work. I remember this location I had to design. I They told me I had to create a theme park. So think about this in Maya. How do you create a theme park in 3D without having a giant location that's going to cost a ton of money? There's a way to do that. You have to problem solve that and be good at thinking up problem solutions 
uh, excuse me, solutions for those problems. And, and then at the same time, giving the art director and producers, and at this time, the owner of this particular toy company, the vision of what they wanted for their characters being represented, represented inside this environment. Okay. So just a lot of this stuff, just a lot of fun, good old fashioned designs. I think I got to work on this project for almost uh, three going on four years um, as, a, as a production designer. Uh, and it was really quite fantastic because I got to oversee so much of the design process and incorporate it from a drawing standpoint. And I had a really super amazing layout designer, a buddy of mine from college, Ron uh, Pegenkopf, who I got to work with too. So he was designing, I was designing, we got to change on the fly, come up with some really great ideas. And it was this type of work that really brought you know, a higher level, I really think, to part of this particular production, you know. And again, I like I really like the slide. It's one of my favorite slides. It was, you know, something I was working on showing the process of understanding good prop design, good design language, how this translates into this 3D models and into this. And then all of these models come together and they make that environment. So, you know, if I'm really picking on a symmetrical cabin, it's not that I'm trying to tear down the artist. It's that I'm trying to give them other choices to become a better designer, think of other options for design. Your This is the problem is that there's all these other schools out there. Not many of them teach you to be a good designer. And one of the things you're going to have to do if you want to make it inside the industry is you have to learn how to design. You have to learn, you know, the language of mood and composition. You have to learn, uh, you know, how do you tell stories from left to right reads, from right to left, how do pans work? How does, uh, that's some of the benefit I had of being a traditional layout artist and background designer was I learned how to do pans and truck-ins and working with storyboard artists. I learned how to figure all that stuff up so I could start to bring that into my finished work of modeling um, coming from a drawing and design standpoint which is quite fantastic. I really love it. Totally miss it. This is, you know, some of my favorite, some of this work here, some of my favorite work I ever got to do working with an awesome director and artist named Ms. Muchi Fawcett, um, still working in the industry too. And I, I really miss getting to work with Muchi. Here's a good example of a task I had to do. I was working on this particular location and in the script it said, the characters are walking around in an old ruined city uh, like ancient Mesopotamia, but there is a language on the wall that looks like it could be Arabic, but it's not Arabic. And it looked like it could be Hebrew, but it's not Hebrew. And it looks like it could be like Sumerian or Mesopotamian. And it's neither of those. So you sit there as the artist and you wonder like, really? You just put that in the script. You just told me there's going to be four different freaking languages inside this location, but you're not going to tell me what they are or which language it is. But the key is I couldn't have any of the, I couldn't have symbols that could represent a real language because we could accidentally be telling somebody that your mom was ugly when we didn't mean to, or you could be telling somebody, you know, uh, a bad word when you didn't mean to. So um, imagine you're creating locations, you have to go create a whole entire alphabet in 3D. That's not just going to happen at a 3D level. You have to start with drawing and designing. And this is what I did. This is what I came up with. I tried to combine a little bit of Asian influence with a little bit of Hebrew and Arabic with some old carvings I, I, I uh, looked up in Egyptian art history and combined that with some Sumerian and Mesopotamian art and uh, even looked at some, uh, uh, some uh, Assyrian works and I came up with these really cool alphabet and then I was able to put these into these walls into this location here and use this inside all of our environment and it really came out with a positive outcome for the production so again that's part of that ability again thinking about designing and thinking that's not all about just hey I got an idea I'm going to draw it on paper and finish one solution that's not what it's about it's about taking things to a finished level and a finished uh, step okay um, here are some other stuff that I did. Again, organic environments. These were actually pain in the butt because they're in a round building. So how do you show in a round building, how do you spin a camera in 360 degrees and show different angles of the room matching what your storyboard supervisor wants to see for strawberry shortcake? You know, stuff like that can be a pain in the butt, but you have to figure that out. You have to be able to problem solve that and design that. 
Um, here's another really cool production I got to work on. Um, this, I, I have had some background in working in theme park design, and um, this was uh, going to be a 3D ride. So what that means is, you know, you'd be at like a particular, let's say you're at Disney and you're going to sit in this ride and the ride is going to take you on this adventure. I got put in charge of a Marvel fight sequence that was going to take place in downtown England by a famous museum. That's all I can really say. Um, and basically what I had to do was draw, design, and then model um, where this fight sequence would take place. And so, of course, there's going to be limitations in Maya on how you could do that. So what I did is I set up my street in the shape of a T. That way I could have multiple cameras. And you look at these angles. These are pictures of Gigantamo, the big model that was going to be fighting Spider-Man and a couple other uh, uh, characters and villains all in this fight sequence. So my goal was coming from nothing. How do I give my storyboard people and how do I problem solve for them the ability to stage up sequences inside one location? And what's that location going to be? Is it going to be a square? Is it going to be um, circular? Is it going to be a long street? I felt for these angles that I could get the best amount of action all in here. So I could have cameras at this way, that way, facing this way, going down here, cameras facing back here. And I could have multiple shots um, to tell a story from a particular point of view in a rough set without having to build a super giant location. This is actually a pretty pretty minimal location that we were able to use for previs to set up all of our fight sequences for this. And and I'll you know working on this was a great a great it was a really fun project. But what we walked away with was the ability of you know I made my storyboard guys happy. You know they it's like I'm getting to work as a storyboard artist setting up key frames for them understanding positions of horizon line and composition and where the characters are going to come in in particular fight se sequences. So you got to remember, Batman might come in one angle. Uh, uh, Spider-Man's going to fly in from another angle. Gigantamo's going to throw a missile at them and then pick up a car and throw it at them. What are those angles going to be best to stage that? So sitting down and working with uh, lots of other artists and problem solving that together, this was the end result for that particular uh, ride that was going to be uh, offered in, uh, in, I can't say where, I'm not supposed to talk about that, but that's just some of the art that I did for it. Here's some more, you know, stuff, uh, more models I did, organic models for strawberry shortcake. There's some different variations and height relationships. There's another location again for strawberry. Again, how do you use, how do you create or organic worlds, not creating too many organics? Well, the way that you do it in 3D, you use your foreground and your middle ground, and then your background has to be a painting. That's what everybody does. So all the white that you see in the background there ended up being a drawing that's painted over. As long as I keep a low horizon line and the proper camera movement and the right composition adhering to what the characters are doing in the scene, you're going to be able to see what's actually happening inside, oops, inside that particular environment. So... Um, that was that. That was, you know, it's cool. There's a lot happening in there to have to think about. It's not just a round building, you know, with some flowers around it. It's thinking about how scenes hook up and what's going to be seen behind them and understanding the 3D process into film. Um, here was part of another thing that I did that was back to the to the Marvel stuff. I was given the ship that somebody else had modeled and there were some parts with it. Uh, there, Excuse me, there's some problems with some of the parts. That, excuse me, that's my dyslexia sneaking in where I switch words. And I had to go in there and, and remodel some things for close-up scenes. So this was the helicarrier that was going to be used by Marvel. And I had to have... Um, some of this was done, but I had to add a bunch of detail up in here. I had to add a tremendous amount of detail up in here in the front area where characters would walk out and be engaging. And there was a whole battle scene where we would see the guns, the weaponry, and all this stuff with the lights up in the front. So, you know, again, it's working on a team effort where somebody might start something, then you have to go in and sort of finish part of that production. And, you know, and, and um, here's something that uh, I think I mentioned this before. That was for Cartoon Network as interior of a fish store that I designed and worked on. There's some more work again, spiral staircase uh, done in 3D modeling for strawberry shortcake. Uh, more strawberry shortcake goodies right there. And, um, uh, Here's some other studio work there that I did. Here's another location. This was a fun location. It was a Nordic Santa's Village location that I designed. 
um, excuse me, I worked with Ron Pegenkop on this and then added to the design and keep adding to the building. These large chunks are snow right here. But again, really fun, uh, especially getting able to see this location from different camera angles and figuring out how those are all going to work. So th there, there is a really important part of bringing 3D into the visual storytelling process and understanding what people are going to see, how they're going to see it, and how it makes sense. Um, this was a dirigible. Uh, a dirigible is a flying device. Um, this had to be a steampunk themed dirigible. So I took a lot of look and reference at steampunk and then modeled, I sort of, you know, sketched this out and modeled it all together in my end, put it together. But I really liked it. Client really liked it. Came out looking really great. Um, so, you know, here in this example, I'm designing props again getting to do this. Luckily, this client let me have a finished render. Sometimes when I do props, they're really, really picky about not letting me have any finished renders or artwork of what I did. But, you know, it is what it is. That's what happens. Here was another finished room we did for Strawberry Shortcake. Um, I talked them out of a round building into a more octagonal, excuse me, a more octagonal shaped um, room that way we it would be easier for the doors to work I know you might be like why not have a round room if you ever tried to open up a door in Maya on a round room it's almost impossible because the door has to be round matching to the roundness and it creates all these cans of worms because there's a part of Maya that has to make sense when things are rigged and they're animated and they're moving you have to make sure these moving parts are coming together and everything's sort of making sense on how that production flows and works together from one point of view to another. So that's why I ended up doing an octagonal room because it's easier to have bookshelves and doors and things in there, but it still looks round when you're moving a camera on it and the audience really didn't notice anything different. All right, so I thought I'd go back in here. I, if you ever wanna check out some of my work, I have, I have some of the work I can show up here. It's really easy. It's, it's an old link I have. It's called philsartportfolio.blogspot.com. Um, I have here things that I can show that deal with digital painting techniques. This was actually a Maya model. That water is all done in Maya. Then I painted over it in Photoshop. That's all Photoshop, Photoshop, Photoshop. So, you know, I, I, I sort of branched out a little bit over time and started getting more involved in the digital painting part because I didn't want to be just the guy drawing all the time. I enjoy, and, and it adds to our industry because a lot of what our industry has changed now is being able to draw, take a rough model or previous set, and then being able to paint over it in Maya and come up with a quick end result. So some of these images here, these are some things I put together when I was in grad school. I went back to school to get a master's degree focused in illustration, uh, excuse me, in illustration with a focus in entertainment arts. And this is a lot of what I did to get better at learning digital painting techniques is I, I decided to branch off and just paint more and, and spent, this is some of the stuff that I can show. Uh, I really love doing these black and white tonal comps. I've been doing these for a very long period of time, um, helping storyboard artists out. How this happened is I had friends that were board artists that would ask me to take some of their board panels and then light them with mood. And what there used to be a position for that in the industry in feature animation, they called that workbooking. But workbooking has sort of disappeared because they don't have the time to do it in TV and DVD production. But what you can do is go in and pick certain scenes and then you can light them accordingly. And then that'll be like the key light for that particular sequence in the storyboard telling the overseas company what everything should look like. So I spent quite a bit of time. I love doing these quick little tonal studies. I've actually become quite effective and efficient at doing these. And I could do a demo. I, I've been meaning if I had a little bit more time to do the demo of these and put them up on YouTube to show you guys sort of the process involved because a lot of this is about shape language. And it's about visual shapes and painting over customized shapes. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if you do that and you understand foreground, midground, and background, a little bit about composition uh, in multiple angles and down shots, you can really come up with some really great ideas very effectively and very fast. And this is what I'm talking about with shape language. Uh, shape language is basically creating a library of like all these different trees and shapes 
that are custom shapes inside Photoshop. And you like, you see that environment there, that thumbnail. I did that thumbnail in about 25 minutes because I already had these shapes down and created. So I just stamped the shapes in there with a brush. I add a light direction, light shadow value, and boom, you end up with these realistic worlds very quickly and, and effectively, even down to water, water highlights, the way water bounces off rocks and other elements, I could apply that into an environment and create something that's pretty convincing that works pretty well. Then you go to this thumbnail phase. You take those ideas, you go into thumbnails, you draw them, you design them, and you know, and, and then you come up with these ideas. So, you know, on, on my YouTube site here, I've never really really shown much of my work, but um, now I'm getting a chance to do that with you guys. But that, that's one of the things that irked me a little bit when I get a couple of the YouTube haters out there that have to come in and then knock down a couple of videos and be like, who are you to be critiquing the student's work and why are you doing this? And I'm like, you know what? I'm the guy that already paid his dues that's been drawing since I was in, in, you know, in third grade and stuck with it. I'm the guy that worked in the industry for almost 20 years that has all this knowledge and background that's bringing it into the classroom that's trying to help you become better designers, understand silhouettes and, and how to draw. I'm that guy, okay? So when I have these YouTube people that come up, they're like, how do you attack that student's drawing in CAV? And I'm like, you know, that's just, if you don't, you don't see the assignment brief or the guideline and what we're doing. So if you have to design a room a, a house with multiple rooms or a prop or a car with, you know, with it does something very specific in its functionality, that's what's really important. And that's part of the design process that we get to. So I've noticed lately the more, you know, subscribers, I wish I had more time to promote my YouTube site, but I just don't, I'm just too busy. You know, I got, I got a family, I take care of my, my I was taking care of my mom and dad and, you know, who are elderly. And then on top of that, I'm running a program at a school and teaching, but you know, it's just life's busy, you know, and then you try to do freelance on the side and um, it just gets hard to balance all this off. But these quick little story comps, learning how to work in black and white, understanding Photoshop, knowing how to come up with quick solutions in terms of composition uh, and draftsmanship and design, th these really to me are worth their weight in gold. And having these up on here, and the reason why they're up here is so I could just sort of help storyboard artists out with part of that problem solving, doing these keys, these key frames that establish story in a mood in in scene and they give you a particular direction an idea of how things are supposed to work okay so that's one of my favorite ones i love this one uh a mech orphanage how would you draw a mech orphanage and i have this idea of like a bunch of mechs that are you know sort of old and beat up but but still very viable behind this little sign behind them parts of an orphanage with birds in the air um, so anyway, there's a bunch of stuff up there. Um, and then, you know, this is Photoshop stuff. And like I said, the majority of work that I did was like this. It was traditional drawing or digital drawing. Um, some of these um, I might do on a Cintiq. Some I work traditionally. I sort of bounce around between multiple aspects, you know, and just work on, oops, different designs. I really enjoyed this one. This one was a lot of fun. Nice piece to get to work on. And um, yeah. So it's just, let me just fly through some more of this work here. I have new work to put up here, but I'm not allowed to show it because a lot of the new stuff I've done over the past couple of years is still under what we call an NDA agreement, non-disclosure agreement. So even some of this stuff, I've had some studios come back and go, you're not supposed to show that work. And I'm like, well, it's already out in production. Nobody's going to care. They're, no one's going to steal it. They're just looking at it. Don't be such a, a Nancy about it. And just, you know, it, it's just fun. Like, here was something I was working on for Disney, Chicken Little 2, and they shut it down. They canned it. They canned it when the merger happened with Pixar. And then the first thing that John Lasseter did was turn around and shut down uh, and lay off a bunch of people. Thanks, John, for being artist-friendly there. Yeah, I was one of those people that got laid off on that production. It sort of sucked, but, you know, it's the way that it is. So anyway, a whole bunch of stuff here. This was that real effects work I showed you guys earlier. Here's some older stuff that I worked on. Lots of tonal studies, other good stuff. Sketchbook, worth its weight in gold. How do I get better, Phil? What kind of pencil do you use? What kind of this? What kind of that? You just need to draw. You get better from drawing and being active with your work and being in a sketchbook. I don't care if it's characters, vehicles, props. You just need to sketch on a regular basis, on a daily basis. 
I don't sketch as I still sketch to this day. I'm not as much as when I was in the industry because when I was in the industry, I would literally work, you know, from like nine in the morning till six. And then I would draw at lunch. I would draw all the time. I'm sketching now, but you know, like I said, I'm busy running, you know, a, a program at school and helping students get work and making deals with companies for internships and stuff like that. So, you know, being able to balance part of life as you get older is balance and, you know, taking care of, of a program and art and then teaching students. I really enjoy being a teacher. And, and as you could probably tell in some of my videos, I'm very passionate about it. Um, I like helping other people. I like watching them grow. I just don't like negative people. I hate the naysayers. I hate the people that got to show up into a room and be like, well, I'm going to complain about something because it makes me feel better. Huh? Even though I have no experience or no background as something, I'm still going to complain because, you know, my mom complains and I like to complain. You know, that that's one of the things I've come to realize that there's a lot of negative people out in the world and you just need to learn to avoid those people and to be true to yourself, be true to your artwork. And uh, a lot of times those naysayers can even be friends or family members that try to keep you down from you obtaining positions and going up in the industry because they see you working on your dreams and then they realize that they're never going to be able to work on their dreams or go to a certain level. I remember when I did this piece right here, somebody saw it and made a comment and goes, gosh, it looks almost like an oil painting. It doesn't really look like a good piece of art. And then I showed it to a couple of friends of mine that were working at DreamWorks and they loved it. They're like, dude, that's a bitch in peace. And so it, you, you get a group of people that are negative that bring your work down and then you show it to other people and they realize like, man, I love that. Do more work like this. Work in this particular area, you know, and, and, and there's something to say about that because there's a part of being, I think, a good artist. One of the things I try to do in my classroom is install good work practices and scheduling and behavior techniques to you as the student so you work extra hard to achieve your goals and don't let people try to bring you down okay all right anyway thanks guys for watching thanks for all your support on youtube i just thought i'd put all this together to talk about some of the classes my goal is from this day forward to offer online classes on monday and wednesday and to try to expand our program outward for the semesters that come going sort of worldwide with our education opportunities Take care, everybody. God bless y'all. And um, thanks again for your support. Thank you all for your support. I really appreciate it. My contact is my email at school. And here it is. It's pdemetriotis at fullcall.edu. Thank you, guys. Take care and keep on drawing.